Welcome. <laughs> we were just saying that normally the last session of the day, you get the inevitable joke of, we are the last thing between you and cocktails. Instead, we are the last thing between, well, the penultimate thing between you and a vegetarian takeaway lunch. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was good. So please come in. Um, and while our tone may be light, obviously the um, subject matter of income inequality is not. Um, that doesn't mean that it has to make us feel um, depressed or dejected because I think we would like to leave feeling empowered um, to do something about it. The, um, it is appropriate that we are here in this city today to discuss this. Those of you in the United States and many of the rest of you around the world will know that from a societal point of view, San Francisco has the most expensive housing market in the United States. In general, the estimates are to live comfortably here at a median house, you need a median income of $119,000 a year. And at the same time, this is a city that just hired six people to clean up human excrement full time from the sidewalks because there are so many homeless people that it has become both a public nuisance and a health hazard. So if that is not the extremes of income inequality, I don't know what is. That being said, these are the principles for responsible investment. And so we have a great panel. Um, you all know our host, Fiona Reynolds. David Wood is, well, you have their titles, and since we have a short time, I will not do it, but David runs IRI at Harvard. Nick, many of you know from four years of running the, the UNAP um, Sustainable Finance Initiative, and he is now at the LSE and the Grantham Institute, and Anna Snyder is the head of due diligence for global wealth management at Merrill Lynch. Um, so I will ask, it's, it may be a horrible human tragedy that we have this income inequality, but Fiona, why does PRI care? Well, it's, that's a very good question. Uh, well, as you've just said, you know, inequality is a major issue, and I think it's one of the most, uh, you know, one of the major issues that we're all grappling with today, coming at it from all different angles. And I think if we, uh, you know, investors are really want to engage in the sustainable development goals. And if we look at the sustainable development goals, I think overall they've got two overarching aims. One of them's about ending climate change. The other's about ending poverty. There's a large part of inequality that sits within the sustainable development goals. So that's one reason that I think that investors are really uh, interested in this issue. But I think the other is much more from an economic point of view. Um, you know, all the academic evidence shows that the more equality that we actually have, the bigger economic growth that we have. It also shows that inequality really slows down growth because we put uh, much more concentration of spending power into the hands of fewer people. So it's not good for the overall economy, of which, as investors, we are invested in the economy uh, to have inequality. So just from, the, just from that perspective. So from our perspective, we have had a number of our signatories who they've really wanted to deal with this issue. We know this is a problem. We know it's not good. We know it's not good for our members. Our members care about this issue. Uh, we have members who are in precarious work and all of those sorts of things. But what do we actually do about it from the investor's perspective? So for us, it was really thinking about, well, how do we take the issue? and then take it into the investor realm. Because we're not certainly suggesting in any of the work that we're doing that our investors are responsible for solving every issue. But it doesn't mean that they can't contribute to it, which is why we you know, worked with TIP really on, well, how do we take this, make some sort of toolkit, make this real for investors, which is um, really what we've been doing. I do think sometimes when people think about inequality, and I'm glad you talked about what was happening here in San Francisco, that they think about the developing world. And I've also had some investors say to me, well, Fiona, but you know, if we look over the last 50 years, that more and more people have been dragged out of poverty than any, mm -hmm. any time 
before. So what are we talking about, about this inequality issue? And while those things are true, we also know that in-country inequality is really on the rise and that the Gini coefficient is, has gone up, gone up in every country. And while it's not the same in every country, Europe is, has far more equality than the United States, States does, and there's everything in between. But this still is a developed and developing world country. It's still something that we all um, have to grapple with. And Paul Polman sp spoke about this morning, and I think we all see these stats every year, about the fact that you know eight people in the world own half of the wealth of the world. And so how can this how can this be good for societies that we live in? And I always like to think and say that, you know, as people, we don't live in economies. We live in societies. And investors and business are part of those societies. And they need to really have a, a strong social license to operate. And part of that social license is thinking about some of the biggest issues that the world is facing. This being one, it's on the World Economics Forum's you know, list of risks that business, that investors do need to consider. So I think there's a lot of reasons that investors need to do this. What we need to be focusing on and have focused on, and we'll talk about it more in the panel, is well, what, what are the levers that investors can pull and what are the things that they can practically do? Great, so you've teed up a couple of things that hopefully we'll get to. First, PRI is coming out with a toolkit. Yes. And a report. Yes. Um, and I think Anna will talk a little bit about that. Um, second, I just want to elaborate on your comment that inequality is not good for global growth. The IMF has some wonderful statistics on this, that for every percent increase in inequality, GDP goes down by eight hundredths of a percent. Um, and for every percentage increase in wealth of, excuse me, in income, of the bottom 20%, GDP goes up by 38 hundredths of a percent, almost four tenths of a percent. So there is clearly a statistically robust correlation there. Um, and then the, the last thing that you mentioned that I think we want to emphasize is income inequality is in and of itself an issue aside from poverty. Great. David, you're the academician. What research is of use to us, how should we think about these things? Yeah, no, I'm a fake academic, <laughs> um, a quasi-academic, and I was looking up uh, something right before the panel, and it turns out in the, uh, this week's edition of The Nation, uh, there's an article on the rise of the inequality industry. So I think I'm a quasi-academic toiling in the inequality industry all of a sudden. Um, there's, so with PRI, I work at the Initiative for Responsible Investment. It's a research project at Harvard Kennedy School. We're applied research, we work with practitioners, and over the past few years, motivated in large part by our work with pension fund trustees, labor-affiliated pension fund trustees in the States, and globally via the Committee for Workers' Capital, um, we have been looking at uh, the way that investors can understand and respond to an issue that has become salient politically. The IMF and OECD studies suggest it has something to do with economic growth and universal ownership, but investors, as Fiona said, don't really know what to do about it. And I guess um, where we are with this project, uh, well, and let me just say one more thing about why it's an issue. I mean, inequality is an issue with the investors we're working with for different reasons. You know, there's the instrumental problem of the, of the hampering economic growth. There's the economic, there's the ethical problem of um, uh, the streets of San Francisco that we've been walking over the last few days. But also there's this uh, increasing link in the research between inequality and global disorder, sort of the falling apart of social cohesion that investors, there's no science-based uh, goal for social incohesion, but it's clearly a problem for investors. So I think that's what's bringing people to the discussion. Um, and what we're trying to do right now in the project with our colleague, Costanza Consolandi, who's in here from University of Siena, is figure out how to take all of this research that's comes out of, that has come out of the inequality industry in the past few years and um, put it into a, uh, a frame and a language that investors can take and use. Uh, because there's a lot that's out there that hasn't really made its way across the road into finance. 
Nick, you've been doing a lot of work on transition to a carbon decarbonized world. We've heard about it. We all assume that is an unalloyed good. We have a president of the United States who has said that is an unalloyed disaster. It puts people out of work, puts coal miners out of work, whatever. How do we square the circle between what many people in this room think, and let's be honest, what a lot of anxious people who see their way of life being challenged think? How do we square that circle? Well, that's a very important point, and I think what is uh, clear now, and it's a big theme here uh, in San Francisco, Uh, is that you, we can no longer separate uh, issues of climate change and inequality. The cli process of climate change itself is one of now the biggest drivers of, uh, of inequality, pushing back decades of, of, of development. Um, and the prospect of a zero carbon resilient economy is fantastic uh, in terms of new jobs and revitalized communities. Uh, but this ain't gonna happen automatically. It's gonna be a process we're gonna have to manage, a process of transition, uh, large segments of the economy have prospered through high carbon uh, development. Uh, and we're gonna need to think as investors, not only about avoiding stranded assets, avoiding stranded workers, uh, stranded communities. Uh, if we don't include uh, the interests of working people and communities, I think we're just not going to be able to hit the targets that we've been setting uh, in terms of climate change, and also not realizing the aspirations of the sustainable development goals. So the, the time of, I think, treating uh, climate as an environmental issue over here, inequality as a social issue over here, that's over now. We've really got to think about integration, not just integration of ESG into investment, but the integration of environmental factors and social factors into the process of, of investment. And that's why it's great to be here uh, working with David uh, and von der Brunsting at uh, IRI in developing a guide for investors how they can grapple with this just transition. This is a really great uh, initiative um, which we've been doing in partnership with you, uh, Fiona, at the PRI. Uh, so thank you for your uh, leadership. But it also has been a partnership with the trade union uh, community, uh, with the International Trade Union Confederation. And again, I think Sharon Bur Burroughs has really put her heart and soul with her colleagues mm -hmm. in how we get uh, the investor community to realize the commitments that you, you've all made in terms of uh, social development in your portfolios and link that uh, with uh, climate action uh, as well. And is that guide available to people? Um, if you're like me, a 20th century guy, it's available on paper. But of course, the, the guide is going to be available through PRI uh, services. Um, and it sets out uh, the reasons why. Uh, some of the systemic risks which we've touched on. Um, it sets out uh, the fiduciary case, uh, the materiality case, but also this broader societal imperative, which uh, Fiona, uh, you are touching on. And I can go in a little bit more detail about some of the, uh, the actions uh, that we can identify. We're going to get to actions in a second. I just want to make another um, investor case here. We investors have been taught, and my background is an institutional investor, that... Um, you can diversify idiosyncratic risk, individual company risk, but not systemic risk, such as income inequality or um, climate change. Um, in some ways, I think theory lags practice. What everyone in this room is trying to do is mitigate systemic risks. And in fact, while that may give a non-differentiated return to various investors, if you can reduce risk at least classic economic theory says, you will increase return because you get a better risk-adjusted return, and so you decrease the risk of beta. And so when you link these two systemic risks, you try to understand that what we're really trying to do here is deal, from an investor point of view, with systemic risks, and if you can mitigate them you can improve the overall capital market efficiency. And that has much more benefit than any sort of alpha seeking that one could do. Right. And so I, I just want to make that point to tie together not just this panel on income inequality, not just the panels on indigenous rights and country risk and climate change, but as a philosophical theory for those of you in the room who've attended the various um, sessions on how to convince skeptics and things like that. And with that as a foundational 
statement for investors. Anna, what should investors do about income inequality? What can we do? Yeah, I mean, and actually, uh, just an interesting thing. You mentioned coal miners yesterday. I went over to the Global uh, Climate Action Summit and the uh, head of the AFL-CIO, for those who aren't from the US, it's one of the largest uh, trade unions we have. And he stood up and he basically said, we understand, he's a, coal, he's a former coal miner, yep. by the way. And he said, we understand that climate, that, that coal needs to go away. We just want a transformational plan to make sure that, that you know, financing doesn't get out, cut, cut off today you know, and, not, and, and workers suffer. We need a trans, uh, transformational plan. I thought, and he got a standing ovation. It was a really, actually very moving and very, uh, for me to see, given all the, the coal miner and, and coal focus in the US that, that people know. But, but yeah, I mean, as an institutional investor, you know, I think exact spot on what you said, which is that sometimes inequality, thinking about how you break that down and you start looking at that in a portfolio can seem very esoteric. Um, but a, a, as you mentioned, uh, you know, really what this translates is, in, I mean, companies, right, or, or issuers uh, are, are based on some pretty, you know, common principles that you need to actually have a portfolio that experiences growth. And for that, you need um, the uh, continued rise in the middle class or actually for people to have individual self-realization and human development. You need to have uh, economic growth. You need to have, uh, you need to understand life expectancies and, and income inequality uh, basically is a systemic risk, right? That can, be, that can be actually broken down into these very quantifiable risks in the portfolio. And I think um, so so uh, PRI and the in Investment Integration Project, TIIP, uh, have published, and, and this will be available today uh, in, in the afternoon, have published a report uh, which is basically talking about the tools that investors can use uh, and, and how we, be we can begin sort of just practically breaking this issue down and, and starting to address it in portfolios. So they, the, 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 this report of which I was part of the working group, um, as, as well as many people on, on, on this panel, obviously, um, you know, looks at A, the need to, to have availability of data, right? And so some of the factors that I was just talking about and many, many more that basically uh, takes income inequality and breaks it down into quantifiable risks and metrics in a portfolio. Um, so that you can actually obviously clarify these risks and then begin to identify solutions to these, uh, to these issues. And, and once you identify solutions, then that can be translated to policymakers. So, you know, back a bit to the, the climate example for a second, I think one of the most powerful ways that I actually saw that I've seen this happen is, is on the climate side. Now, I think there's been, obviously, I would say that, uh, the climate side has a lot of, obviously, quantifi quantifiable statistics that they've used. But in the run-up to, to Paris, um, you know, series and, and um, uh, it, it brought together investors, uh, corporate investors, uh, at the UN. And unlike normal UN events, for instance, um, the, it wasn't all public officials speaking, it was actually the corporates speaking to the public officials and saying, this climate has an economic impact on our businesses and that's why you need to go to Paris. And so it sort of, to me, switched this, it was a really interesting thing where exactly what this report is talking about in terms of in income equality, you know, you had scientific uh, and quantifi quantifiable uh, risks that then you know, policymakers or sorry, corporates or investors could translate into uh, actual risks, right? Economic risks, and then can and then with that identify solutions where policymakers could go do the work that they did in Paris. And if we tran, you know, and, and again, you know, to your point, if you take that and you connect those dots and tr and, and 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 think about income inequality in that same way. Right, I think you can begin to, to, to think about different solutions to that, and I can talk about that later on the panel. 
can I just add to that? I think some of the work that we've tried to do here, as well as say, again, because we know that in a lot of our investors care about this, but what are the simple things that we can do? I think the toolkit also points you to some areas that investors do have some control over. So, for example, one of the things that in, some of the things investors can do is make sure that they engage on the issue with companies about tax practices and tax transparency. Companies not paying tax is not good for the economy. It is not good for anybody. Um, it means that countries then uh, don't have enough money to be able to provide social services. Those things get cut. We have to go back to think this thinking that, you know, Paul was talking about this morning of the circular economy, how everything is linked and how everything works together. We can also engage on CEO pay versus median salary. We can engage on the issue that we need to make sure that workers get fair pay, that they get proper um, health care in countries where that needs to be provided from by the employer, that they get pensions. All of those things are issues we can deal in. We can deal with the gender pay gap that is also causes inequality. It also causes a drag on economic growth as well. There are plenty of things that, that in, um, sometimes investors don't think about to engage with. And it's same with the just transition issue and why we've done a lot of work on this. You can't win the climate argument and we will not win the climate argument. We look at what's happening here in the United States and in other countries. You know, I live in the UK but I'm from Australia and same sort of issues going on there if people feel that they are going to be the losers in the climate wars. You need to bring the population along. You need to make sure that those people who are in, are in cities that rely completely on a coal mine or whatever it might be, are also thought about. So what we want to do when we take the Just Transition work is think about other programs that we already have, for example, with Climate Action 100+. Huge engagement with companies. We talk about scenario analysis and how we're asking companies about what their two degree scenario plans are. But it has to be more than thinking about the physical assets. It has to be thinking about, well, if, you're, if you energy company is transitioning out of these areas, what is your plan for that workforce? What's your plan for that community that relies on you? Is there extra opportunity and investment that can be made? What are those things that are happening so that, uh, it, it, again, that it's much more circular in, in thinking? Right. You know, Paul Pullman um, made an interesting point today that the drivers of economic activity have changed from heavy capital, heavy plant and equipment to human capital. That 82% of the S&P 1500 market cap, for instance, is in intellectual, intangible, and that's driven by the workforce. I mean, I'm sure everyone in this room who's ever engaged with a company has heard the first line, our most important assets go up and down on the elevator every day, right? Our workforce is our most... And yet, when we engage with them, it's a cost to us. How do we drive the cost down as opposed to how do we bring the productivity and skill level up through worker training, whatever. And there are a number of coalitions that PRI has been... Um, assisting here in the United States Human Capital Management, and there's one in the UK, and I apologize, I forgot the initials. There are sometimes too many initials in the world. Uh, <laughs> but, and, and, and you're working with ITUC on the, on the just transition. And, and, and so those sorts of engagement, um, once we have the data, as you say, make sure that that is available, but then we can use the data. I I've always find that Mike Musaraka, who also helped write the report, was saying that it's fascinating that we spend so much attention on the details of CEO compensation and so little on the composition of the workforce mm -hmm. pay. And that if we would just spend a little more time on engagement, I help. David, what are the other drivers of income inequality? What, what, what should, because if we know the drivers, we will know the levelers in effect of how to reverse engineer it and fix it. Yeah, I mean, there's so much research that's out there. So I'm going to expand that a little bit to say, what's sure. the research out there that investors can tackle? And in particular, if the challenge is um, inequality is being treated as this secular trend that's kind of apart from what investors do or not something they can, they can approach, how can we break down the research in a way that um, changes investor behavior? 
So the first is on the drivers and consequences of inequality. And so with Costanza, we sort of came up with four topics we'd like to generate a dialogue between researchers and practitioners on. Um, you have the drivers and consequences of inequality. Um, demographic trends, globalization, these are the kind of big sort of stories people are telling about inequality. Most of the research these days is on the human created causes of inequality. Changes in the policy regimes which uh, distribute wages, the fissuring of the workplace which Mike talks about um, uh, wonderfully and is, is a big part of the TIP report. Uh, union density is directly linked to inequality um, um, in most uh, studies that have come out. These kinds of um, pieces of the puzzle about the driver or, or, or the way that inequality um, is generated are pointing ever more towards the sort of tractable issues that investors can address. Um, the consequences, I'll leave aside for the interest of time, but you know, the changes that inequality causes in health, in education, in the development of uh, sort of lifetime earnings are you know, dramatic and, and sort of relevant to investors on the human capital side. Um, then you have a second question in the research, which is what is the role of finance in creating inequality? And a lot of the research these days says that financialization is linked to income, uh, to in-country growth of inequality. And so the financial sector has a particular um, role to play in scrutiny. And by financialization, would you just define the term for Yeah, that? so, so there's a growth of financial practices, but also the extension of financial practices into other uh, uh, parts of, uh, of economy and society. Uh, so one of the things that the economist James Galbraith talks about in the U.S., income in country inequality has gone up um, to the extent that people's compensation is tied to asset prices. Stock-based compensation is linked to the way that inequality has grown in the U.S. And it's also this kind of um, uh, well, research into financialization is linked to the kind of work that Nick did on sustainable financial systems, sort of how can we have a systemic response and how can investors participate with PRI in making a sustainable financial system that makes the world more equal. Two more uh, in terms of sort of fields of research. The first was drivers and consequences. The second was financialization. Um, the third is the sort of role of corporates and uh, um, how uh, uh, inequality affects long-term corporate performance, classic responsible investment ESG studies. We don't have a lot. Uh, that's hard to do because of the, med the relationship between corporate performance and the broad system of inequality is difficult, but there's some research that investors should pay attention to. Um, but also there's a lot of uh, research coming out about market power. Uh, monopoly, monopsily, uh, monopsony, corporates and market power and how it's related to inequality. And investors are the investors in these corporations that have that kind of market power. Um, the last thing is the public policy regimes. And tax comes up in the tip report. I'll leave that to Anna to talk about. But I think these are really important investors' roles. And I think PRI has been uh, a great and motivating discussion about tax. Um, and inequality is part of that. Uh, but there's also the positive agenda of inclusive growth and where investors fit into this broader discussion being driven in places like the OECD or the G20 or the UN mm -hmm. around uh, investor relationships with other stakeholders and how um, the financial system can lead to inclusive growth. And that's driven a lot of our interest in the just transition work that, um, that Nick and Vonda are leading. Okay, Anna, Nick, you both promised specific things that investors could do. Um, let's reverse it, Anna. What, what, give us a list of specific things that people in this audience can do. Yeah, so uh, around David's point, I mean, I think that right now I would say rather than there being clear solutions, like you go look up a bunch of mutual funds and ETFs that address income inequality, mm -hmm. you're not really going to find it. It's not probably one of the most marketing well-branded <laughs> things to call your investment product anyway, but, but you're not going to find, right? I mean, we all know, we, are, we sort of know this. And I think what, what, where we are in this right now is really at the quantification stage and, and identifying the risks. Um, and I think, for instance, people like helpers who are doing really interesting work, for instance, in taking the SDGs and then and tagging their investments to you know, both from a risk and opportunity standpoint, what, what, what um, SDGs th th they're, they're tracking to. But, but this, this is really where we are, right? Um, it, which is I, the, the risk identification versus potentially the solutions to mm -hmm. income inequality. And that's fine, that's just, that's a fact, that's where we are. Um, I, you know, I think that though, 
what I've seen, you know, and, and again, and this is different across different asset classes. So in the public equity space, the, the, those who are trying to think about this really are taking sort of your classic, uh, for lack of a better way to explain it, like multi-stakeholder model, right? So they are looking for companies that are, that are as considerate of their shareholders as they are of their workers and the clients and the customers that they're affecting and the communities in which they operate. Um, so, so this very classic sustainability, holistic view on a company actually maybe doesn't intend to just uh, target income inequality, but a lot of the things right around your workforce, human capital, et cetera, get, start, to get, um, start to get included in that holistic assessment as to whether just the management team that you're, work, that you're investing with is actually thinking about these issues. And so I think it's just, you know, maybe seems obvious, but it's a way to start thinking about addressing, um, addressing these. And, 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 and as Fiona mentioned, how you engage um, with that. You know, in the, in the fixed income space, um, there is uh, a lot of work going on in the U.S. Um, and then in, in this sort of, it takes a different shape in different geographies, but in municipal bonds. I mean, you, the municipal bond market, for instance, in the U.S. is the most obvious place where you can address income inequality um, and issuers uh, are understanding the demand uh, that investors are looking at, institutional investors are looking at in terms of uh, sustainability as a whole, but obviously when you can literally get at uh, gender inequality or focusing on uh, parts of the, the you know, your, your constituents that, that are in the lower income bracket, I mean, th this is a perfect space, right, for you to think about how you are engaging with issuers or, uh, around income equality through the municipal bond markets, right? And I know, you know, similarly in the, in the UK and other areas that there are, there are, are ways to do this through um, public fixed income, the public fi fixed income markets. Um, you know, in terms of private asset classes, of course, you know, microfinance, uh, DFI financing, CDFIs uh, have all been focused on this just for decades um, now, but I think that there have been, there are a lot, there, the, especially for instance in the CDFI market in the US, a lot of these, uh, a lot of these solutions are becoming less, you know, community reinvestment act, CRA focused and more focused on sort of the risk and returns that institutional investment Can you just define, so. it, these are community development yep. financial institutions for yes. those of you not in the US, and they tend to be lending institutions with specific geographic or income um, foci. Right. So just, sorry, we, we tend to, um, I get confused by initials, so I assume other people do, and I yeah. apologize for apologies. that. Apologies, yeah, yeah. This is the, the financial markets, you know, <laughs> to, 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 totally have, make acronyms just like fly off the tongue, so sorry. Right. Nick, anything to add to that list? Yeah, I mean, I think the important thing is we're not saying the investors should have set up a new and separate Just Transition program. Right. I think what we're saying is the Just Transition is actually the best lens through which to look at your climate change program mm -hmm. and your broader commitment to sustainable development. So there are some obvious things that investors can do, in fact, are doing. You incorporate the Just Transition and the social dimension into your climate change uh, strategy. That's what the Environment Agency Pension Fund in the UK has done, what the insurance company Generali have done, and particularly in Generali's case, very interestingly, focus on stakeholder dialogue as part of uh, the climate change uh, strategy. Engagement, uh, Fiona, you mentioned Climate Action 100 Plus, a powerful platform for incorporating just transition. I think just building on what you were saying earlier, John, if you look at the TCFD, which we're all very, very pleased with as a key mechanism, if you look at it through the lens of the human being, there's almost nothing to do on human capital management in it at all. So nothing on skills, nothing on employee engagement, nothing on social dialogue, uh, nothing on health and safety, nothing on community relations. And so that's one of the things I think in terms of engagement and in the guide, we set out uh, key questions for the Just Transition using the TCFD framework to incorporate that so social dimension so you get a r richer sense. Capital allocation across the asset classes, clearly a lot of things can do uh, in terms of actually stimulating new, new products. I think on the real assets, there are quite a lot of prizes there. Um, you see uh, already uh, institutional investors such as Calpers, 
having responsible contracting policies in terms of labor practices and so on, and applying that to renewable infrastructure. So renewable infrastructure delivers high quality jobs and good, uh, strong uh, communities. And then sort of policy and partnerships. Um, I think you already have governments launching just transition commissions in, in Canada, in Scotland, in Germany. Um, and I think what hasn't really happened there is the link particularly to uh, investors. And I would say probably one of the things investors can do as they encourage governments to have sustainable finance plans that, is, that for example, are happening in Europe, is to incorporate the just transition uh, element there. And then I think probably like inequality more generally, this all happens in place. Mm -hmm. This all happens in place. I think we've got used to thinking about the time dimension investment, short term, long term, and so on. But actually, how do you connect uh, investors uh, with the problems, the social issues, the environment issues, in places where you have industrial clusters and, and communities and so on? And I think that's one of the areas where certainly we've been learning a lot from the work in Quebec, uh, from Fond de Solidarity, uh, FTQ there. So I think that's a, uh, another, another area. Can I just add to that, I think the other part is really around, um, act, of active ownership, is really around the whole precarious work situation. And you know, over the course of this conference, we've had you know, a, a worker from a warehouse, warehouse who you know, drives three hours to get to work and then you can get there and be told, we don't need you today. Um, you don't get paid for that time. Or, workers in hotels who then can drive three hours because they can't afford to live in San Francisco, of course, and can, tur and can turn up and only have their shifts cut down to be three-hour shifts at minimum wages. Uh, you, you know, the engagement where you are finding these people in really difficult working situations and investors are in, in invested in these companies but find it difficult to engage with the company because they go to the company and they say, well, we don't employ the workers, we use this third-party hire company and you go to the third party hire company and they're just, just a conduit. So how do, what are we going to do as an industry to really engage about labour relations? And these are the people that you then find in really difficult, with really difficult situations in terms of precarious work, but therefore that flows onto their salaries. They're not, they don't, therefore don't get any benefits at all and are finding themselves really on, you know, at the bottom of the pile. And in that situation where, you know, and we hear this talked about a lot, that for the first time a group of people don't feel that they're doing better than their, their parents' generation. Mm -hmm. And this then has all these other flow-on effects. This is where in the US there's huge, a huge opioid academic, epidemic. It comes from the fact that people are living these terrible lives and what do doctors do? They medicate them to help them get through what is a terrible daily life. And there's a new, there's a new research and a new book that's come out, and I'll, I'll, I apologise in advance for swearing, that's <laughs> called Shit Life Syndrome. And that is what they're now, they're now calling, you know, they're now saying that there is all of these people yeah. who are just living in hugely wealthy countries and are having terrible lives. And for the first time in the US and in the UK, we've got people in their sort of 60s starting to die in huge numbers that wasn't happening even a decade ago. Again, because people are living in, in wealthy countries in incredible amounts of poverty. But they're not people who are living on the streets. These are people who are actually going to work every day. But they don't make enough money to be able to bring up their family and to live their lives. And we, I think we do have a role in sort of the whole active ownership labour standards part there as well. To, to play in trying to tackle some of those issues. This is why I love talking to you because there, there are about 80 things to unpack there. Um, so, so let me try to link um, some of them back to some of the things that Anna and Nick were saying. Um, many people in this room have private equity. Before you even hire your private equity GP, it would be nice to know whether they think that workforces deserve living wages and are drivers of wealth creation or are cost centers to be minimized. Hotels generally are owned by institutions in their real estate um, holdings. Now that doesn't mean that the hotel management company is, but the hotel management company is hired by the real estate owners which are traced back to institutional <coughs> investors. 
Um, so there are lots of places to engage there. Um, Anna mentioned community development financial institutions. There are affordable mortgage funds. There are community land trusts. Um, there are affordable mortgage-backed security funds, um, that all of which um, are investable at scale for institutions. Um, you mentioned engaging with the companies um, on whether they have, you know, fair employment standards, and I would extend this now to financial institutions. One of the shit life standard issues is predatory lending and whether or not either in online or physical traditional lending institutions are providing 3,000% a year payday loans or whether they have a more responsible um, lending policy. So I, and, and as Nick, as you said, um, all this happens in place, in location. Um, there are economically targeted investments, uh, CDPQ being the most noticeable, sorry, I violated my initial <laughs> Case de Depoy plus Monte Quebec um, being the most noticeable. Um, and, and I would just argue one other thing. Cornerstone Capital recently came out with a report that they talk about um, racial and gender inequality, but that clearly plays a role into economic inequality. Many of you who are of my age or even slightly younger um, may remember um, South African issues or even the McBride principles on fair employment in Northern Ireland. And so in conflict situations where you have international investments, you can certainly um, play a role there. Yes. Can I just say, I, I think this is an interesting um, fact that, that gender lend or gender focused in mm -hmm. investment strategies, um, the, the demand for them went up by 100% uh, year over year. Um, now, it, the, the base of that is still small, but a billion dollars went from about 500 million to a billion dollars. Um, in, in, but, but I am seeing, and I love this because I am seeing institutional investors with RFPs who are asking me every single day, what is the, what is the population of diverse managers that you have on your platform? And it allows me to go out and make that a priority because investors are asking, right? And they're not, so it's not just the investment managers themselves, but strategies that, uh, that target and benefit uh, diverse populations or, or but, but that, invest, like, so, so I work, you know, at, at a pretty big institution and, and, and that is a really huge signal that we're getting and, and something at least that's, that's positive as opposed to Speaking of okay. <laughs> Can I just add on the gender yeah. lens, the other yeah. issue on gender, because older women are becoming the largest group of the new poor. And part of that is because there's a lot of women, when you, know, you go to work, and as a woman, we all know you don't get paid as much as men, and that's just a fact. And so therefore, if you do, if you do get a pension, if you're in a defined, pe defined contribution or a defined benefit pension, that is paid on how a percentage of your salary. So therefore you get paid less in your, in your pension. You have less retirement income available to you. You, um, you know, that you're then in the, so that you're then in the situation that you're living longer. Women live longer than men, but they have to live longer with less. They also take time out of the workforce. Women are still the only ones who can actually give birth. So you take time out of the workforce. You often don't get, uh, in many countries, you don't get any retirement benefits when you're, mm -hmm. when you're um, on maternity leave e either. And in some countries you still don't get, in this country, not everywhere, do you even get um, maternity leave coverage. So there's all of these other factors that play, that also come into, into things. And mm -hmm. I think, again, I come back to the fact that we have to think in a much more circular way. And I think one of the things that is a problem sometimes in responsible investment is that we really silo our issues. So it's an E issue when I'm thinking about it this way, it's an S issue when I think about it this way, or it's a G issue. And there's very few issues 
that are just one of those. Most of the issues have got some form of, of nowadays of environmental issues, there's social impacts for those issues, and there's definitely always a governance angle. And we have to be able to think about them in a much more holistic way, and we have to think about, I think, sometimes the cause and effect as well. So we would invite holistic questions, <laughs> um, or non-holistic questions. Um, from the audience. I, I will tell you that because the lights are in our eyes, it's sometimes a little hard to see, so if you have a question, like get up and wave your hand or something and a microphone will find you. It's a question in front. Hi, my name's Aaron Brenner. I'm from the UFCW Pension for Employees here in the United States. And I wanted to take off from something that both Fiona and, and David touched on. And that was um, one of the causes, David said, of uh, income inequality is the drop in union density. And uh, then uh, Fiona talked about the importance of labor relations and I was thinking that maybe one of the things that investors could do is as they engage companies is to ask about the question how they deal with issues of freedom of association and the right to collective bargaining, which uh, are, and this is true for many country, companies across the globe who are signatories, uh, for, say for the UN Global Compact, uh, but yet do not in practice uh, support those rights and encourage those rights. Uh, unions strikes me are a way to address income equality, not just by raising wages, but by giving workers a voice at work and a voice at which can address a whole series of issues around climate, race inequality, gender inequality in their communities as well. So it's a way to sort of uh, help those folks who we're talking about here uh, mobilize themselves and organize themselves. And I was wondering if you that made any sense to you. <laughs> and the question is, should we do that? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, totally. I mean, I, so inequality isn't necessarily going to be a driver of a specific response, but it's a lens through which to see the way you engage corporations. I mean, I think if I understand where you're going with the comment. And um, Shareholder value maximization has been a way to take inequality and concerns with it off the table and to take the power that investors have to shape the way that corporations engage their, their workers kind of off the table, right? Because we have to concentrate. But I think inequality is another path uh, as responsible investment is generally towards a broader view of how corporations exist and how investors exist in society, the sort of things you were saying in the morning with Paul Pullman. And uh, one of the ways that uh, investors have a great deal of influence is on the relationship between employers and workers. And collective bargaining and freedom of association are central to that. Um, and um, if you want research that sort of helps demonstrate that, it's out there. You know, we have pretty good research. So uh, there's a support for taking that broader view of understanding what the long-term relationship of employers and employees is going to be. And I'm going to try and get in two more quick questions. Um, it's also, I think, interesting that the ITUC was involved in the Just Transition paper for exactly that reason. Can I just add uh, very quickly, I think also from our perspective at the PRI, when we think about our human rights work, we, all, we try to think it in a very holistic way. So human rights, part of that is labour rights. How do you take the UN guiding principles, but how do you also use the ILO conventions that you don't just kind mm -hmm. of cherry pick parts parts of rights, you need to think about it in a very holistic way. Mm -hmm. Two more questions, or are you really so anxious to get to that vegetarian lunch? There's one and two. <laughs> uh, thank you, Jason Masters, uh, United Financial Services Australia. My question is aimed more at the academics. Um, we heard Paul uh, this morning talk about the importance of working with NGOs. We, we're talking about inequality, and if I would take an example in Australia at the moment, um, our government, or at least the Prime Minister, is attacking transgender people who are in a very inequitable place in, in society and in the employment area. 
But a lot of the research is behind pay paywalls now. Mm -hmm. So the NGOs are really struggling to get access to the academic research to actually address inequality. Mm -hmm. So where are universities going to go with actually making the research that often is funded by the governments, not always in America, but in other places, yeah. actually available so that people in the NGOs can then work with the investors um, with good quality research availability. Well, so the, the corporatization of the university is an example of financialization, and that's why you have the paywalls. Um, I, you know, I don't want to speak for university systems, but um, I think there's a lot of concern with the generation of public goods that is the purpose of this research and, and how they're deployed. And I think that's a, a, a special case of a more general problem, which is how we think about public goods in a world as investors where what we're trying to do is get the, the cash flows that come out of investments for our investors' benefit, right? That is the job and that makes sense. But it has an uneasy tension with the generation of public goods that are free to all and allow us to have a healthy, thriving economy and society. Okay. I would also argue that there's a, it's a, one of those situations where people forget purpose. If the purpose, and you know, there's a reason why you, most universities have not-for-profit status and get tax breaks. It's to provide a public good. And so um, I'll just speak for my institution, which is not a university. But all of IRC Institute's data is available free of charge publicly. And for those of you who know the institution, you know that we are actually going out of business voluntarily at the end of the year. And the successor organization, part of our grant to them was they had to agree to make our intellectual property free and permanently, well, available for 10 years. By that time, it'll be out of date, uh, free and publicly available. So, um, you know, I, I, I do think um, in some ways, that discussion is a broader one and it can be applied, for instance, to asset management or anything else where there is a need to generate some amount of revenue and all of a sudden generating revenue becomes the purpose instead of a means to provide the purpose. John, could I? Please. Could I? I mean, I think it's a, it's, it's a, it's a great point. Um, it's being addressed uh, internationally through the Global Benchmarking Initiative to actually drive a lot of the, the data analysis into the public uh, domain. In the climate sphere, you have the Transition Pathway Initiative uh, with, with PRIM and others hosted uh, at Grantham, which provides uh, public information. And we have new initiatives, uh, such as the Workforce Disclosure Initiative, which I think if you put those things together, you start getting high quality public just transition analysis. And I know we're over time, but I promise one last question, so please make it brief and we'll try to make our answers brief. Sure. Uh, my name is Rob Wilson uh, from MFS Investment Management, and outsourcing has certainly been one of the drivers of inequality from a developed market standpoint, but I think as you look at some of the statistics, it also suggests uh, that it has obviously helped uh, grow the middle class uh, in emerging markets and has, in some cases, it seems, reduced inequality as if you were to look at it on a global basis. So I guess I'm just wondering, you know, are these, is um, improving inequality-related issues in developed markets and kind of continuing that, that improvement that you're seeing in uh, emerging markets, are these things mutually exclusive or how do we manage this? David, Anna, you want to talk about fishing and supply chain management and how to deal with those issues or? Yeah, I think um, I've talked enough. I mean, it's a great question. I mean, I know you think that too. Um, uh, it, you know, there's tensions in all of these sorts of things and we're really focused on income, in-country income and economic inequality because that's what's been growing, that's the trend. Uh, it's been growing pretty much everywhere. Right? I mean, the collapse in global inequality is because of the growth of middle class in China and India. And China wasn't from outsourcing from, the, you know, from, from Western companies. It was from displacement of work to China, but it was a different kind of process than you get probably in the Indian middle class. Um, but the essential question of what level of inequality creates a social instability and an unjust society to the extent that economic growth is constrained, you can wrestle with that even when in any individual case you're going to find you know, um, uh, complex ramifications of a decision. Uh, so I don't think because there's the growth of a middle class um, uh, that is, I don't know, you know, and I have to say I don't know that research all that well, like how much associated it is with outsourcing, but just because that happened doesn't mean that the fissuring of the workplace uh, isn't a central issue that investors should wrestle with, right? I think sometimes it's used as an excuse to, to, to avoid the issue rather than to, kind of tackle it in its complexity. 
I think the other thing, Rob, is that uh, in the countries that have, you know, the biggest happiness index, the Scandinavian countries, etc., et you don't have as big a gaps between the rich and poor. So part of the part of the problem here is that it's fine when everyone's moving up together. So people are coming out of the working class into the middle class, middle class into upper middle class, etc. And when that happens that works. But when you have one group of people who are extremely left behind, you've got people at the top who earn way more than, you know, half the world, that becomes the problem. So we need everybody moving up the ladder together. I was going to have everyone summarise, but this red light has been blinking at me. <laughs> so um, since I have the advantage of Fiona being on the panel, I am going to give you an opportunity to take 30 seconds to say whatever you want to the audience around income inequality. Um, I think it's an issue that's really important in the SDGs. Those people who want to um, deal with the SDGs need to deal with economic inequality. I think it's a huge risk and there are definitely ways that investors can engage in it. Again, investors aren't responsible for solving every problem in the world and we're not suggesting that. Mm -hmm. But there are ways that you can come at this in a very investor lens, in a, a way that works for your organisation that will make a difference. And on the just transition, the other issue that we have up on our um, platform is an investor statement on just transition. We're asking signatories to sign it or to look at it, see if it's something your organisation wants to be involved in. It's talk, it just really talks about the fact that you'll incorporate the thinking into your investment process. Our aim is to be able to use that when we get to COP24 this year to show to governments that investors do care about the wider issues in climate, I know I'm over 30 seconds, and that they need to be thinking about the transition of communities and workforces when they're thinking about climate change as well. Thank you. I think we've outlined a lot of problems, a lot of drivers, a lot of ambiguity, but also a lot of tools. So I, I hope you leave, and there are more on the PRI website. Um, I would hope you leave here feeling somewhat empowered rather than discouraged. Would you please thank the panel? Thank you.